Hello there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. So today I want to look at 10 commands that you really, really, really need to know on Windows that's using PowerShell or the command line. I'm going to cover secure shell and curl and ping and all kinds of stuff. Really, really useful stuff that if you're a power user, you really need to know. So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. Now, before we get cracking, I would like to thank Blinkist for sponsoring this video. So 10 Windows commands that every nerd should know. Now by nerd, I mean power users and developers. The command line is a magical place. A nice quote there from a Marvel TV show. Uh, and really mastering the command line is essential for increasing your productivity. Now the command line is either the command prompt, which is kind of that command prompt that came from the days of DOS and it kind of grew up into the Windows environment, or PowerShell. Now I'd recommend using Windows Terminal because there you get access to the command prompt, to PowerShell, and to the Windows subsystem for Linux, all in one nice application. So this is a follow-up video to five tips to help you learn Windows PowerShell. PowerShell is Microsoft command line shell and scripting language for Windows, but it also works on Linux and Mac OS. The command shell can be a daunting place since it is oriented around .NET objects. But I do have this video, five tips to learn PowerShell. It really is an easy introduction to the PowerShell. And you may find yourself using PowerShell once in a while rather than just using the command prompt. Now these 10, 10 commands we're gonna go through work on the, generally on the PowerShell and command prompt. I will note differences when they only work on one or the other. So here's the first one. This works on the, both the command prompt and the PowerShell. Secure shell, how to log into a remote Linux server. Great if you've got, for example, a Raspberry Pi on your network, you're connecting into some remote hosting. If you've got a, a cloud instance on Oracle, Azure, Google, whatever it is that you've got, you can connect to that using SSH. SH, that stands for shell, secure shell. And the format is the username and the host names are here. Secure shell, Gary at 192.168.1.88, now that's a Raspberry Pi 4 with 8 gigs of RAM that I've got running here on my home network. And so that will just log in directly. I'll show you this in a demo in just a moment. You can also do secure shell and then the username and the IP address and then run a command. So it will connect, run that command and then disconnect. Okay, let's go over to the command line and let's see this working. Okay, so here we are inside of PowerShell. So we're going to do secure shell. Gary, that's my username on that Raspberry Pi, 192.168.1.88, 1.88, and I've, there you go, logged in. So there is the, uh, there's that Raspberry Pi, I can run commands like HTOP, uh, quad core, look at that, eight gigs of memory, uh, and that's it, and then control D to log out and return me to PowerShell. Now, as I said, you can run the same thing, uh, again and run a command so we could do uname minus a so it'll run that command on the remote machine and then return to powershell and there it's showing me that it is linux it's kernel 5.15 and so on and so on arch 64 uh, there you go the 64-bit uh, version of linux running on there for the arm 64 architecture now, normally when you connect with uh, Secure Shell, you have to type in a username and password or provide the username and then type in the password. However, it's much better when you use a public a, a key and a private key, a key pair. Yeah, cool. I've got lots of videos on how public key and private key works if you want to check those out. Now, there is a program called uh, Secure Shell Key Gen. Generate the keys for the Secure Shell. It will create a key pair and that will help, that will create that private key and public key for you. Now on Linux, there is this secure shell copy ID command that doesn't exist on Windows. However, there is a way of doing it. And this is the way you do it. Now I will leave this uh, in a GitHub document uh, along with some of the other commands. Uh, and you can just go and get that. The link will be in the description. But basically type that, that catalog cat, that concatenates out, uh, lists out this file, which is the public key. It then pipes it into secure shell. So you then secure shell to the address that you want. And then the command that you run, as I showed you earlier, was to concatenate that, add it to the list of authorized keys. So basically it takes the key that you've got, pipe uh, displays it out uh, to the standard output, pipes that into secure shell, and then you run a command where it takes the standard input and adds that to the end of the authorized keys. So let's see that in action. 
Okay, let's run the program to generate the key pair. So shell key gen. Okay, creating a public private key. Where do you want to put it? Best place to put it in the private low in the default location. You don't need to have a passphrase. Okay, done all this stuff here to showing you it's creating random stuff, and that's it. It's now created those two files. In fact, you can do a. It's just shown you there the thing, so we can do a, um, for example, dir of that file there, and there it is, and we can actually look at that file. There like that. This is my public key. So that's okay. That's all the right stuff you'd expect to see for uh, a public key. Brilliant. So here's that long command that I've mentioned. So basically we are printing out, concatenating to the standard output that very file we just looked at there. And then we're piping that into a secure shell connection to my Raspberry Pi. And then we're executing command, just like we executed uname minus a, which is to add that to the authorized key. So very simple, you do that, and that is now copied. So when we do the secure shell command, which I did earlier, and it actually worked, uh, the, the, you don't need to type any username and password because the keys are already there. Very, very useful command to know. Now, once you've got secure shell running, once you've got the keys set up, there's another great command related to all of this, and that's how you do copy, secure copy. So here I can copy a file. Let's call it hello w.c. That's a hello world program. And I copy it to my Raspberry Pi, and I want to put it in. Notice here now the colon and then a directory, the source directory, and it will copy that across. And you can also do it the other way around. I can copy from that directory to here. Now, I often use this when I want to copy files from one server to another. Maybe I've edited them on multiple files. You know, I want to try it on Raspberry Pi. I've compiled it on a Mac. I want to try it on Windows. I can just copy these files around. Of course, there are other ways of achieving that, but I do use that quite a lot. So that's a great little command to know as well. Okay, let's just see that quickly in action. Okay, so here I'm inside of the source directory. And I do have a file here called hello w.c, print hello world. Very simple. So I can copy that now to that Raspberry Pi. Very, very simply, hello world.c to Gary at 192.168.1.88 colon. Now, no leading slash because I want it to be my login directory. If I did that, it would start to look through things from the root, from root downwards. So I want source slash and then just copy it into there. And it just copies that file across. Really simple. You can copy multiple files. You can use wildcards uh, and so on. And you can do the opposite as I showed you uh, in the slide back the other way. Now here's a fun one for you. You can change the prompt of the command prompt. This only works on the command prompt, doesn't work on uh, PowerShell. Now you use the prompt command and then you can format the, the command using all these special uh, identifiers, these special modifiers. So for example, if I had prompt $D, $S, $T, $underbar, $V, $underbar, $V, P, $underbar, $G. Well, what does all that mean? Well, $D, for example, look down here, current date. Followed by a dollar S, what's that? Well, that's a space. Dollar T, what's that? Well, that's the current time, it's a date and time. Dollar underbar, what's that? Well, that's a carriage return. So I'm actually building a multi-line prompt. Dollar V, the Windows version. Another carriage return line feed. Dollar P is what? The current drive. So that's, you know, the old classic C colon backslash. And then finally, dollar G gives me that uh, greater than sign. So if I do that, I'll actually get a prompt like this. So date, the time, version of Windows, prompt, and then an empty line. Now, I find this useful because you start now over on the very left-hand side, not over, you know, a few characters in. If you had a longer prompt, if you go in further into deeper directories. So I like these multi-line prompts, especially the end here near the beginning. Also, if you type in prompt with no parameters, it will reset it back to the default. Okay, let's try that out. Okay, so let's type in that prompt command that I was uh, showing you. We went through what it all means. So this is the normal prompt, you know, that's your prompt. So we can just type in all of those using those modifiers and now we get that prompt, which is uh, pretty cool, <laughs> if you ask me, but that's just me. Maybe you don't agree with me. But there you go. Now, if you type a prompt on its own, it will clear it back to the one where it's just the standard path with the greater than sign at the end. So Blinkist is a service where they take non-fiction bestsellers and they distill it down into the key ideas. And it's perfect for curious people who love to learn and busy people who don't have time to read. 
The bite-sized chunks which cover the most important things are called blinks. And using those blinks, you can get the key ideas from non-fiction bestsellers in minutes, not in hours. They also have a new feature called Blinkist Connect, which allows every premium plan to be shared by two different accounts for free. Another great feature is Blinkist Spaces. That's where you can create a group, a space with friends, colleagues, family members, and you can recommend blinks between you. And even if someone is not a premium member and they're in that space, they get full access to the titles that you recommend. And the latest blink I listened to was about the downfall of BlackBerry, of course, that iconic smartphone company. Now, if you are an entrepreneur, business manager, if you're into marketing, then you need to understand why some of these iconic companies of the past have failed. And always with Blinkist, I was able to get that information quickly and assimilate it and help me understand what happened in that situation. Sign up today and get a 25% discount off a premium plan. All starts by signing up for a seven day free trial using the link in the description below. Now, another quick tip, if you are inside the command prompt or PowerShell, if you type explorer space dot, dot of course means current directory, it will open the Windows Explorer in the current directory. You don't have to open it in the current directory if you type explorer and then a directory, C colon backslash users backslash Gary, then it will open Explorer uh, for that path. Okay, let's just quickly see that. Okay, so if I want to run Explorer from the command line here, I just put Explorer like that, and up will come the Explorer in my home directory there. Now it also works the other way around. If you've got the Explorer open, Windows Explorer, you can actually start the command prompt or the PowerShell in that directory. So what you do is here is the uh, pa uh, the Windows Explorer up here at the top where you would normally type things in, uh, change directories up there or change uh, you know a search. You can just type in here PowerShell or CMD and it will start the PowerShell or the command prompt in that current directory. Let me show you what I mean by that. And as I was showing you, if I click in here, I could type now here command and it will start up a command prompt there in the C users, uh, Gary, exactly the same directory that I am. Wherever directory I'm in, that will be the directory it will be opened up here. So I said we can use curl to get the weather in London. Let's do that. There you go. The forecast for the next few days uh, and so on. That's really, really good. We can also get the definition of a word. So let's do that one and that will go away and get the definition of the word explain, which we've got all there. And then, as I said, you can also fetch files. So if I just go into that source directory of mine where I do keep my uh, source code, type in that one, get the thread test tool. There you go, it's downloaded it. And uh, we can type uh, more of the thread test tool. And there's that code exactly as you'll find it in my GitHub repository. Now this one only works in the developer command prompt for video, Visual Studio. So if you have Visual Studio installed, one of the things Visual Studio will do is set up for is a command prompt for Visual Studio. It has all the paths set up correctly so that it can find the different compilers. And once you use that one, you can like com compile things on the command line, just like you would sometimes under, you know, under Linux or Mac OS. So CL is the compiler, compile and link. So you can say command hello world.c and then you'll get a binary out of it and then you can run hello world dot exe or you can run a, com a dot net program so you can do dot net new console that will create the project that you need for a, a new console app uh, and actually the default is a hello world program and then you can do dot net run and it will compile and run that let's just see those two things running so here i've opened a visual studio developer command prompt this only works with the visual studio command prompt won't work with a normal command prompt let's go back to my uh, directory with that source code in it that I showed you uh, earlier in the, in this uh, users Gary source. So that's where we've got my hello world program compile hello w.c and now there is a hello world uh, executable which we can run hello world simple as that. And as I said, if we wanted to, we can make directory for something for .net so we could call it hello. Uh, net let's just go in there it's good to do this in separate directories and we can say dot net new console which will then create all the files that you need here using a template for a console application and so we do it here here we have and here we have program uh, dot cs which is basically hello world automatically created for us dot net uh, if i can type that help dot net run and it will compile and run that for me uh, straight away 
which it has now done hello world. So pretty simple, all from the command line. Okay, number nine, how do you can make a folder replace a hard drive? Now this is really useful. I had a while back a, a drive that was in my machine and I used it, for example, for Steam. It's actually where the Steam library, there's a whole hard drive dedicated to my Steam uh, library and I knew that it, there was always gonna be space because it was downloaded onto that drive. That drive failed at some point after several years and I, by then I'd actually added other drives to the system and they were bigger and better. And I thought, I don't really want to, uh, you know, have to install another drive. I'm just going to use that same drive letter, but as a folder of one of these other drives that I've already got here that are now, you know, four terabytes or eight terabytes or whatever it is I've got here. So what you can do is you can tell Windows, well, it used to be my drive F. Rather than drive F, use this folder. So you substitute a drive associated a, a path with a drive letter. So substitute a particular drive with a particular path. So here I'm saying substitute Q, in my case it was F, with C slash slash the Q drive, which is a folder on my C drive. And now if you drive, go to the Q drive, it will see that folder. So I use that and Steam carried on working. I had a backup of, of that folder. I restored the backup, but now on the other drive, associate the F drive with it. And now just Steam keeps on working. I didn't need to put in another drive and threw that old one away. Really useful command to know. Let's see it. Uh, in action. So if I create a folder now here called the Q drive, okay, and we go into the the Q drive, and let's do something in here. We'll just create another directory called Barb. Hi Barb. Okay, so that's there. So we do uh, substitute Q C colon four, and then the Q drive, the folder we've created. Okay, that's done it. Now, if we go to the Q drive and do a DIR, there's our folder Bob. So now the Q drive is a drive just like C, D maybe, and now you've got Q and it's actually just a folder on the system. Okay, and finally, some networking commands. And there are lots of networking commands that work for both the command prompt and the PowerShell. These really are the bread and butter of any kind of network debugging you do. The first one is ping. Can you reach... Uh, another host on your network might show that you've got a fault with a switch or with your uh, IP uh, configurations on either that your your host, your Windows PC, or on the remote machine. So ping 192.168.1.88. We'll just see whether I can reach that Raspberry Pi. Do a an NS a DNS query NS lookup. So if I do a DNS lookup for Google.com, it will tell me its IP address. Another great one to make sure you haven't got problems with your MAC addresses, that somehow something's gone wrong there with caching or whatever. ARP, uh, that's address reverse lookup for the MAC address. ARP minus A will just show all of the addresses that you've got. Uh, and then there are a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, net shell, trace route, IP config, net command. These are all available in Windows, but really Windows networking commands are as you could write a book on them. Well, people have written books on them. So the, that's just your intro to it. If you, you should know how to use ping NS lookup and ARP. And then after that, there are a whole bunch of others that would be useful uh, as well. So really, those are work really, really, really essential for understanding. So let's just look at ping NS lookup and so on and see those in action. Now, finally, a few of those networking commands, ping 192.168.1.88, that Raspberry Pi, getting a reply back, gives you the time it took as well. There you go, absolutely perfect. Uh, we could do an NS lookup for google.com that will look up in DNS and give me back the uh, address, both the IPv6 and the IPv4. And finally, we could do an ARP minus A and that will list all of the different ARP addresses that are uh, hanging around uh, on my network. There is that 98, that's the actual the ARP address for my Raspberry Pi. Uh, and that's it. So some basic networking commands that are really useful for uh, debugging, just the simplest things to do with your network using the command line. And before we sign off, just a big thank you again to Blinkist for sponsoring this video. Okay, that's it. My name's Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. You can follow me on social media uh, on all of the trendy places, some more trendy than others. All the addresses there are on the screen for you. You should really subscribe to my channel if you liked this video. And if you did like it, by the way, I would appreciate it if you gave it a thumbs up. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.